this the fulfillment we want Mubarak to get out of ancient prophetic text what about the weird weather anomalies hundreds of cars were entombed in snow the magnetic pole has shifted magnetic north is moving there are those who say that something has happened to the moon the moon looks funny the moon looks out of place the moon is shifted the moon doesn't look the way it's always looked to me why is it that an earthquake occurs of 7.0 or greater almost on a weekly basis what about the tens of thousands of birds falling from the sky are we looking at extraterrestrial disclosure Again, is it business as usual? Is this normal? This is Watchers 2. Ancient prophetic texts written thousands of years ago tell us that in the latter days, there will be wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, and troublesome times. What we are seeing in the Middle East is certainly wars and rumors of wars. With the recent riots in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen. The action follows political unrest in Egypt and Tunisia that saw both countries' leaders step down. Possibly Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. The level of violence peaked in the Bahrain capital, Manama. Tear gas was fired at anti-government protesters and gunshots also rang out. Are we looking at a redistribution or a reconstruction of the existing borders in the Middle East? What is going to come of this? We're not certain as of this broadcast, but I will say this. There is great unrest in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, on the Arab street. The fact that we're pushing democracy as naive as can be. Uh, Iran is perhaps the model because they'll go from you know, an autocratic situation to democracy, just giving the power brokers an opportunity to move in. And that's how they, it was a matter of months, and they became uh, Ayatollah took over and so forth. And I think the same pattern could repeat itself in, in Egypt because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the democracy itself is an unstable form of government. People don't realize in the United States it wasn't a democracy, it was a republic. The rule of law is what it, its foundation was supposed to be. And what's interesting isn't just Egypt. We see the same undercurrents in all. Throughout the entire Arab world. Yeah, you betcha. Jordan, and, Yemen. And you're going to see it in Europe. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, Europe is waking up to the fact that they don't know how to deal mm -hmm. with uh, Islam in Europe. Ancient prophetic texts tell us that there will be three events in the latter days. Uh, biblical scholars will differ as to when these events actually happen. The first one is Psalm 83. Are we looking at a loose confederacy of Arab nations coming up against Israel and Israel defeating um, those combined armies? That would be one uh, prophetic scenario. Psalm 83, the motivation is to wipe Israel off the map and it includes their immediate neighbors. And that is shaping up very crisply. Israel emerges as a major prosperous power out of that. I personally uh, am among those that see the view that Psalm 83 is a precedent condition that sets the stage for Ezekiel 38. A second prophetic scenario is Isaiah 17, which says very specifically and succinctly that Damascus will be destroyed. We know that Damascus is the oldest inhabited city on planet Earth. That's never been destroyed, not like what the prophecy is telling us it will be. About a year and a half, two years ago, there was some saber rattling between Syria and Israeli officials. I'll never forget it. The Israelis said, if you, pointing to the Syrians, use chemical weapons against us, we, the Israelis, will annihilate you. Syria in 1973 could have been conquered easily during that, uh, the Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for Kissinger coming and telling uh, you know, the Israeli troops to back off, we could have occupied Syria. Plug Isaiah 17 in here where it says, Damascus is a ruinous heap, and one begins to wonder, are we on the cusp, the edge, of these prophecies being fulfilled? Combined with that is the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, which gives us a list of nations that comes up a confederacy of nations. And by the way, 
There is not an Arab in the bunch. The prophecies that are found in Ezekiel 37 and 38, by the way, which are read yearly in synagogues on the Sabbath, that these prophecies do definitely have some in, uh, uh, portentousness for what's going on today in, in Israel and the rest of the world. But if we go back 37 chapters earlier into Ezekiel 1, he's not in Israel anymore. He's on the banks of the rivers of Babylon. And he's seeing, the, he sees a vision of a chariot, this divine chariot in it, the Merkava as we call it, and the, the Hashmalim, these oracles of, of, uh, of electricity, electrum, that are running through this incredible vision that he's having. And he seems to be pining for that moment of, of total revelation where there's no separation between the body and the soul, no separation between humankind and, and the Almighty, and that everything was clear as it was to Adam and Eve in that pristine existence of Garden of Eden. We are just north of Detroit, and the moon is up tonight. It is totally not where it is supposed to be. As my lovely Deborah says, she has no clue what this means. I've been watching the moon at least the past 45 days. It is not only uh, totally in the wrong spot, I mean it's completely and utterly and totally without a doubt nowhere near where it normally is. On December 21st, 2010, the winter solstice, we had a lunar eclipse, which hadn't happened in 420 years. But there were some people who looked at the event and the moon afterwards and began to say, why does the moon look funny? Uh, is it out of place? Has it shifted? Gee, the moon, the shadows look different. What, what's going on? We tried to find out and get to the bottom of it. We took what's known as a red camera and went up uh, in a secret location in the Hollywood Hills and shot the rising of a full moon. And we compared and, and sort of did an A-B between our footage and what another videographer had taken of the moon. And what we discovered was that it appeared like the lunar surface somehow had rotated about 135 degrees. How can that possibly be? We called the Griffith Observatory, Jet Propulsion Lab, Pepperdine University, and UCLA. All we're trying to do is ask some questions. We basically got the door slammed in our face. No one would come on the record. No one would address the issue. I found another site that was telling me that the moon is out of phase. It's not in the place that it should be. In other words, um, According to local maps that show you the different phases of the moon and what it should look like and how it should look like, uh, whether it's a gibbous or a crescent and what part of a crescent or what degree of it, it should be crescent, when you go out and actually look in real time, it's about two days off from being out uh, in a proper phase. And it's almost as if the moon has clocked itself 90 degrees off of what it used to look like uh, with the craters and the seas and everything slightly out of position. Uh, we tried to get to Griffith Observatory to have us come up and ask some of their people uh, what was going on with the moon, and we were turned flatly turned down. I mean, immediately there was no, there was no well, nothing, no goodwill at all. It was just bam, door closed. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you got to uh, remember who's paying the bill at the. Uh, Observatory, I believe it's the county that's responsible for the observatory. And I think if they came out uh, with any uh, conclusive statements as to any of this or pole shifts or anything else, uh, they might be spanked. So they just don't <laughs> want to get involved. We also know that the sun apparently came up two days earlier in Greenland. In other words, Greenland from the winter solstice on out is completely, northern Greenland, completely covered in darkness. And yet, the sun comes up two days earlier. Well, maybe it's, it's, this is proof of global warming because in a year's time, somehow the ice shelf melted 50, uh, 100 feet. So we can see, I mean, exactly. Exactly, it was unbelievable. Boulder dash. Yeah, boulder dash, poppycock. But it's um, apparently, allegedly, according to the stories, we're still trying to bet some of this stuff. The green, the, up by the Arctic Circle in Greenland, it's dark for basically 30 days. And they know precisely when they see the first dip of the sun came up two days early. Going back to the moon, and, and are these things connected in any way? We know that right after the lunar eclipse, people began to discuss 
that the moon, the lunar surface, seemed to have shifted. In February, as the moon is upside down. You're right, Henning, this is weird, man. Weird, weird, weird. I believe that the moon has rotated to the right substantially. Or the Earth has rotated to the left. It seems that this should be big news. So there is something definitely going wrong here. And I just wanted to make the video to document it. It is February 10th, 1130 at night. I can't stay out here for very long because it's only um, five degrees out. The Torah codes have been mathematically proven that there is some sort of a hidden code within the text of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. We have contact with a rabbi in Jerusalem, his name is Rabbi Glazerson, who sent us this Torah code over here concerning the moon. And this is what it says. Will be observed a change in the moon in 5771. That's the Hebrew calendar that corresponds to our date of 2011. Coincidence? I think not. Lorenzo Iorio from Cornell University has written a paper under General Relativity and Quantum Cosmology. The title of the paper is this, On the Anomalous Secular Increase of the Eccentricity of the Orbit of the Moon. The bottom line here, his closing statement is this, Thus the issue of finding a satisfactory explanation for the anomalous behavior of the Moon's eccentricity remains open. The phenomena of sinkholes, again, are appearing in countries all over the world. Some of these sinkholes are absolutely huge. I mean, they're acres, and they go down deep into the earth. Again, is it business as usual? I mean, is this how, is all these different things, are they connected somehow? Are they signs that, that were written thousands of years ago into ancient prophetic texts? Or is it just coincidence we're looking at here? Well, the sinkholes definitely are uh, uppermost in the mind of a lot of us looking at current events. And the thing that kind of um, amazes me is that the sinkholes are circular. You know, they're almost perfectly round. Now, my theory or hypothesis of the Earth expanding, that this would stretch the surface uh, non-uniformly, that there would be like elongated uh, collapses or cracks open up. So. When you see these sinkholes form, some of them are due to water erosion over a long period of time, leaky pipes and whatever. And then when, possibly when the earth is doing expansion is doing now, that weakened area just collapses underneath cities, whatever, driveways. But uh, I do think that the sudden increase of all of them happening so, so, uh, in such a short period of time, and with the magnetic field variation and with the, the uh, earthquake increases, I'm thinking, and of volcanic increases, I'm thinking that the sinkholes are somehow related to the stretching of the mantle of the Earth by this uh, expansion phase we're going through. Let me give you some facts about the Guatemala sinkhole. First of all, this thing was 66 feet wide and over 100 feet deep. It actually might still get bigger, believe it or not. So this thing might be growing. Some people are saying that the source system might be to blame, but we're not sure exactly what we're looking at. Also, we know that sinkholes like this in Guatemala have happened before. But what we're seeing is that it's not only in Guatemala, these sinkholes are happening on a global, worldwide level. Almost on a weekly basis, one of these things appears somewhere, and sometimes they're shallow, but other times they can swallow up intersections, fire trucks, cars, houses, restaurants, and on and on it goes. We know for an absolute scientific fact that magnetic poles have shifted. Just when you thought there couldn't be more change going on in the world, it turns out magnetic north is moving. Aviators knew this. It's always moved, but not like this. In fact, it's on the move about 40 miles a year now along the polar cap toward Russia. But because of it, some airport runways calibrated by compass are now three or four degrees off. Now, all of this might sound a little confusing, but let's get one thing straight. The runways aren't physically moving. All that's really changing is the number. While different news agencies postulate that the magnetic pole has shifted 20 miles, 40 miles, 30 miles, and there's a disagreement, one thing is a certain commonality between all of these news sources. It has shifted. We know that. It has moved. Now, when you 
tie in the idea of a magnetic pole is shifting, then I got a, uh, a roundtable discussion from scientists admitting that the magnetic, the electromagnetic currents over the Earth are diminishing. They're they're losing their their power and effect, and they were concluding that this seems to be one of the stages of when there's uh, when there is about to take place a, a pole reversal. We know that it happened at least one time in our past. Um, we're talking about stuff that you know where the end of dinosaur kind of things, uh, the end of an epoch, and going into a new age or whatever. This is coupled also, though, with our understanding of the electric universe. We, we, uh, the plasma physicists have risen to finally be heard. You know, uh, when Ben Franklin did his famous experiment with a, with a kite, in which he miraculously wasn't electrocuted, but in any case, he was the one that demonstrated the sky's electric, but everybody's ignored him. The astronomers have ignored him. The astronomers try to explain what they think they see in the universe by not going beyond the 16th and 17th century. Hmm. But up in the north, in Sweden and Norway, the scientists there, because of the auroras, and start, they started to be aware of plasmas, they studied that. Today's uh, uh, vanguard in physics is in the plasma physics. You hear all this nonsense in the press about uh, black holes and uh, that 96% of the mass of the universe is missing. The actual mass of the universe, 99% of it, is in plasma, it's an ionized gas. And uh, so, uh, uh, and so, as we understand that, we suddenly understand the galaxies and so forth are electrical. They're not impacted by gravity at all because people don't do their homework about Newton's law of gravity. There's an interesting article in uh, June of 2005, Scientific American, where they're studying the fact that the constants, Planck's constants in physics, is changing. Speed of light slowing down, Planck's constants increasing to keep the energy equal. But the point is. Their conclusion, their words, not mine, their words. Mm -hmm. If the constants are changing, it implies that our reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. Mm. And I picked that up, I thought that's really wild because that's what the Bible has been saying all along. There is some divine communication that's going on with this. There's no question about it. What does it portend? What specifically will that do if the magnetic uh, influence is somehow altered by this, could it affect weather patterns, can it affect the way in which um, the seasons, you know, are changing, global warming, all these other unknowns are, are all up, up for uh, conjecture as far as whether or not there is something specific that's going to happen uh, in the end of day. And so I do think we're seeing a magnetic field change in the Earth, a uh, significant one, and it may go on for weeks. Uh, it it may go on for months or years, but with the, the rate at which things are happening, I'm thinking this may be rather sudden. And if it occurs quick enough, like in, in hours versus uh, you know, days, it may generate electric currents in all of our electronics. Something's up, <clears throat> and, and this uh, seems to be in the universal consciousness, because it's almost everyone that you talk to is going to tell you a story about uh, themselves or something they've seen or their cat or their dog uh, you know habits are changing um, people are changing animals changing the world is changing mm -hmm. uh, events are changing the weather is changing economics is changing uh, population values are changing governments are changing uh, systems are collapsing so I mean you have to be an idiot right. <laughs> not to recognize that there's something going on but, uh, you know, uh, what's the end of all this uh, going to be? That we don't know yet. That, that we don't know. Is this the fulfillment of ancient prophetic texts, which were written thousands of years ago, coming to light in these days which we are living in? Recently in Redondo Beach, millions of fish just died off and were floating on the surface of the water. Millions of fish. Is there a correlation between animal and fish die off like that? In other words, beach whales, beach dolphins, um, millions of, of sardines or other aquatic animals and earthquakes? Uh, some people think that there might be. And what's interesting is California is certainly due for a big one. Could we be looking at are these dead fish sort of harbingers, if you will, uh, to a, an impending quake that might devastate 
Southern California. Week after week, what do you think is going on and do ancient prophetic texts warn or tell of the time that we're living in? Indeed, this is a, a very intriguing question and there are more than one approach to understanding it. The first thing that has to be said is that anything that's in terrestrial or in the seas, at all those effects, anything that occurs to these creatures are all done for the sake of mankind, of humankind. There's no creation that was created for, for, for vanity. There's nothing that was not purposeful in God's creation. Mm -hmm. So one has to understand that this does not work in a vacuum. Anything that occurs to things living on earth or in the sea, but based on Jewish philo philosophical understandings, means it has some purport for humankind. You know, I've got a little bit of background. My first year in college was in marine biology. Now, if this was a natural event, they certainly would have taught me that as one of the basic elements of, of the way populations will die off if they're overpopulated. I was never taught anything like this. This thing never happened. Off the coast of Brazil, there was over a hundred tons of fish that That's washed. A fish. That's a lot of fish. Yeah, that, no, this is something very unusual and out of the ordinary. The Zohar, which was written about 1800 years ago, and was attributed to one of the great scholars of all time, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in the, one of the passages dealing with predictions of the future, there is a date mentioned there. Hmm. It's not usual for the Zohar to mention any dates, but it does do so. And it says that in the f fifth millennium, in the 600th year, in the Hebrew calendar it would be 5600, which takes us about 140, 150 years ago, the world will have the accelerate in supernal wellsprings of knowledge that will come both from below and from above, hmm. imbuing the world with a great potential for holiness, for, it, for it, inspiration, for knowledge. How this knowledge is processed will determine the course of, of, of humankind. Here is a flight advisory that came from the FAA, and this was dated uh, for January 20th through February the 11th and February 15th and 22nd. The Department of Defense will conduct GPS tests on January 20th through February 22nd, 2011. During testing, the GPS signals you use may be unreliable and unavailable. And then it gives, there's a map. The map shows uh, a circle centered at just off the coast of Georgia and Florida at, at the borderline of the two states. And this map goes out, you know, the circles of screw up of the GPS signal goes out until it covers Alabama and the bottom part of Virginia. It's in all of Florida, it's huge. Now they did the same thing over on the West Coast saying this is going to be a Department of Defense test. And then of course we had earthquakes in Nevada right after that test finished. <laughs> and they say the test only goes for 45 minutes and then a 15 minute off time and then it comes back on. Now what would screw up GPS? Is it magnetics? You see, it's, it shows an area of influence uh, rather than the whole planet or any that kind of stuff. They're showing circles of influence. And um, this might explain why birds, particularly dependent upon magnetic fields, um, were confused. Why is FEMA putting out reports uh, warning uh, people to get prepared along the New Madrid fault line? Get your stuff together. And they're doing that in the last three weeks. You, you see, there's, <sighs> there, there's a problem. I had a lunch with Otto von Habsburg some years ago, and, and uh, during that luncheon he made two remarks that at the time, one of which I understood, one of which puzzled me. He says the ignorance in America is overwhelming, and I knew what he meant then because I used to have a, a, six, a substantial staff in London when I was chairman of a public company. And, and I was always amazed how the people in London knew more about our elections in California than I did. We too. Yeah, because they were just very oriented to current events. And, and in contrast to most of most Americans look at what the ball scores were over the weekend, that's about it. Well, the second remark he made, I didn't understand what he said. He says the concentration of power in America is frightening. And I didn't know what he meant, because I thought, gee, we have uh, open democracy, we're open countries, you know. But since then I've done a little more homework and I realize what he means. It's astonishing to realize how we are being managed. And I, the, the 2008 elections are an exact, uh, a wonderful laboratory study of that. So when you look at what's coming, it's clear we're moving into a, a well, I'll put it another way, we are subjects of a managed agenda by people for many motivations, some may be very noble, still look for a global, moving towards a global and government and America's global independence global. is in the way. So there is an agenda to break the back 
of America because it's in the way of a larger agenda. And we watch that operative because America is no longer a producing nation, it's a consuming nation. Mm -hmm. And we survive only because of our ability to borrow from foreigners, but that's ending. And so the, the, this is all coming home to roost uh, this year and next. It's not, it's not going to last for much longer before it all gets normalized somehow. But uh, the people that are least aware of this are the American public. In 2010, spilling over to this year, 2011, there have been three major earthquakes in what is known as the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire basically extends all around the west coast of the United States up into Alaska, down into South America, swings over into New Zealand, Australia, and then up towards Japan and then back around again. That is known as the Ring of Fire. And what's interesting is in 2010, we had the Chilean earthquake. It was one of the strongest earthquakes ever measured. And security cameras captured its 90 terrifying seconds. It struck in the middle of the night. Chileans struggled to get out of buildings, some in just their pajamas. It was so, so intense, and I was seeing the sky changing colors, and it was really sort of a apocalypse now thing. Then in 2011, the Christ Church earthquake in New Zealand. trembling and, the, and the, the rocks are falling down. Followed very recently by the Japanese earthquake in which the island was struck by a 9.0 earthquake and of course shortly after that a devastating tsunami swept inland and, and wiped everything out of its path, death toll in the thousands of people. It's when you see something like this, Ivan, unfold before your very eyes that you get an idea of why there is very, there's nowhere to run when you have something like that coming so fast towards you. And of course, you know, it appears to be fairly slow when you're looking aerially, but if you're on the ground and that is moving at such that a is, fast speed, you can see the boat there. Um, just unbelievable pictures. There's a building or a couple of buildings that are on fire and are moving with the tsunami. That is just a, something you just had never seen before. And there's a, a pretty big vessel there getting pushed ashore. So many people think we are actually attacked by earthquake. What I saw was like that, that almost every damage is from tsunami. From coast to two miles, there is nothing. They used to have thousands of houses, roads, and you know, people. But right now, uh, the beside course, you can't see town. It's just a pile of garbage. Is it business as usual or something greater? Are we actually accelerating? Are these devastating events that we see, are they beginning to accelerate, come in more rapid succession? Is that what we're seeing? I believe it is.
ちょっとこれはひどい。We can look at the BP oil spill and realize that that certainly is an event that what I would categorize as a troublesome time. Well, with the tsunami and earthquake happening in Japan, what we have now might be another type of Chernobyl. In the former Soviet Union, a reactor in Chernobyl, the core melted down, and and all this radioactivity was displaced into the atmosphere. They are still. Even today, you cannot go into that area without protective gear, and you can only spend a few hours there at a time. The problem, what we're looking at in Japan, that there are six reactors. As of this post, four of these reactors are unstable. Unfortunately, due to the magnitude of what happened at the Fukushima plant, there's going to be an affected area for decades to come. This event will affect many people in that area and possibly outside that area for. Years to come, having operated nuclear power plants in the past and still being involved with this line of work today, first and foremost, my thoughts go out to the workers there as they battle this tragic event. Fuel rods will continue to put out heat for as little as days to as much as years. It all depends on some factors of the fuel rod itself, how it was operated during its lifetime, and its makeup. Within the fuel rod, what occurred at the Fukushima plant, however, is that you have a damaged fuel rod. This resulted in some of the fuel pellets within that fuel rod to cluster towards the bottom of the reactor vessel. This forms a mass that's superheated and will take a while to cool down. Before the devastating earthquake, followed by the horrific tsunami that hit Japan, life went on pretty much as normal. People awakened, showered, went to work. Drove cars, children played in the playground, tourists came, fishing boats went into the harbor, out of the harbor. Life was pretty good. What we see is the fragility of life. To prevent or otherwise minimize the risk of an event occurring like this again, we have to have continuous evaluations of all the nuclear plants throughout the world. You know, let it be known that there are plants of the same design on the east coast of the U.S. and also the east coast of Mexico. Um, these are the same design and in a very similar location on the coastline, just like those at Fukushima and of other plants on Japan's coastline. Most people don't understand because our news media doesn't go back and cover this. In Haiti last year, 250,000 people perished in a devastating earthquake. What most people don't realize is, as we speak, there are a million people displaced by that very same earthquake, living in tents. In Haiti, and now with the outbreak of cholera, the death toll continues to climb. Christchurch and New Zealand are still cleaning up from the devastating earthquake that happened there. The floods that swept inland in Australia. Some people are saying that there'll be inland lakes maybe for decades. They're still trying to clean up that. So what we see is one disaster followed by another disaster followed by yet another disaster. It sort of begs the question: Are events accelerating? Are these, in fact, the birth pangs that were told in ancient prophetic texts will happen in the last days? In Watchers One, we showed how Dr. Roger Lear is a world expert in the area of alien implants, having done removal surgeries on 17 different patients. His research uses hard science, electron microscope analysis, and spectrometry to learn what's inside these things and what they're made of. He continues to investigate, and the actual scientific results always go beyond high strangeness. We went back to Dr. Lear to ask him a few questions about what he's now discovering in the latest. On miniaturized structures, they're finding inside these implants that can only be seen by using an electron microscope. We've got some questions, and、um, I'm going to shoot them to you right now, sir. 
What new information do you have regarding the implants? Well, I kind of had a feeling you were going to ask that <laughs> question. Well, um, <laughs> the research uh, that's uh, coming uh, out now is a little more advanced uh, than what we had in the past. Um, it's a learning process, a learning curve, because as the the instrumentation improves, so we know a lot more about the carbon nanostructures mm -hmm. that we find in these mm -hmm. objects. We know they're more complex than when we originally found them, because a, a carbon nanotube in itself is an inter interesting and extremely strong structure. Basically, you take one row of uh, carbon atoms and you roll it upon itself and you got a carbon nanotube. But when you put uh, these uh, together uh, in one form or another, then the structure can get more complex. So you take a number of carbon nanotubes and you can make a carbon nanofiber. You take uh, carbon nanofibers together and then you can make carbon nano ribbons or carbon nanospheres. And then as you build on these building blocks, they get more and more and more complex. And uh, that's what we're finding is that these are not just simple structures, but these have a definitive uh, type of carbon nanostructures for design for a specific purpose. And that purpose uh, undoubtedly is something that uh, we know as uh, advanced uh, uh, nanotechnological electronics. So that's, that's one of the things. And then the other, I guess, big news, which our uh, viewers may be interested in, is that one of our uh, members of our science board, who is a, a nuclear physicist, uh, looked at this and he looked at the age of the universe. And we can tell by the uh, time that it takes from one isotope of material, such as boron, to its degradation point, uh, boron becomes beryllium. And it takes uh, X period of time to do that. Mm -hmm. He can tell from that uh, rate of isotopic decay what the age is of wherever that came from. Huh. So he devised a, a mathematical formula uh, comparing this to ages of the universe. And we know that these are probably coming from an area of the universe that's at least uh, 30 million years uh, ahead of us. If we look at the galactic distance of about 900 million miles, that's the Milky Way galaxy, we're probably talking about a minimum of at least uh, one third the way across the Milky Way galaxies. When we're looking at uh, the distances for the materials of the objects, uh, we are talking about galactic distances, not star systems or um, wow. or you know planetary values. And uh, the, the other uh, important thing here, which I, I have to uh, mention, is that you know if you live uh, in Southern California, let's say you're usually not going to travel. Uh, to Nevada to get a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if that notion is uh, uh, factually and logically solid, then uh, if the materials are found you know, in that region of the universe, mm -hmm. then most probably the people that are using them or the entities that are using them are nearby. So it gives us uh, uh, a clue as to where some of these uh, entities that are visiting here might come from. The nanotechnology that you're talking about does not exist in nature, and to the best of your knowledge, um, even underground labs, dark science, have not been able to to create these. Is that true? Uh, partially true. Okay. Uh, number one, they don't exist in nature. That's true. However, <laughs> the technologies today, about seven years ago, have proved that we can manufacture a carbon nanotube. And now uh, there are a couple of companies that are just starting to do it. But this technology is far advanced mm -hmm. uh, of that point. And this has evidently been in usage by whoever is using them for a long, long time. Is it true that the implants can repair themselves? In other words, let's say they're damaged in someone's skin, or even if you take them out. Have you seen, is there any evidence that these implants can repair themselves? Well, the only evidence uh, of a restructuring that we have is the uh, one case 
in which the object came out in small pieces mm -hmm. and we placed it in a container of the patient's uh, blood serum mm -hmm. and looked at it in 48 hours and it seemed to reassemble itself in the order of which we took it out. So uh, self-repair, um, aggregation of objects for <laughs> your memory, yeah, maybe, I, I don't know what the explanation is. So I think there is a, uh, an inference to the fact that they can possibly repair themselves. Recently, there's been YouTube videos of a UFO over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. One and two seem to be taken from the same vantage point. Three appears to be a hoax and has already been debunked. Four is at a different vantage point. And when you, when you sync these three um, videos together, one, two, and four, you see, we see that it seems to be the same phenomenon. In other words, it's like, uh, there's car, and especially in four I like, because you can see the cars moving in front of a temple mount. Now, do you think it's real? Do you think it's a hoax? Weigh in on that for us. Well, let's uh, say what I'm not first, and that is a video analyst by any, uh, any leap of faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we do have a member of our board who has a, uh, an optical uh, physicist with a PhD, <laughs> and he's looked at these things. And so far, uh, the three that you're talking about, one, look, two, and four. Yeah, one, two, and four look like the genuine article. Number three, it was so obviously a fake that um, even a casual observer like me would notice that uh, there's nothing moving, <laughs> nothing moving in right, the background. Right, right. Uh, there's no you know, glimmer of, of the lights, no reflections, no nothing. And then uh, Jaime Mossan from uh, Mexico sent me the uh, still photograph that was uh, photoshopped and, right. uh, and the light right. put in. So that one we have to totally disregard. But the other three look like they could be uh, the real thing. Tyra, give us a thumbnail sketch of who you are and why you've come in to take a look at these and what's your area of expertise? Well, I've been doing a lot of, of um, special effects work in my, my day, um, setting up computers for a lot of special effects houses, mm -hmm. and so I know a lot about visual effects in general. Um, and, you know, it was interesting to me to watch these and, and realize that a lot of them might have been visual effects. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing research on it myself and came to the conclusion that I believe that all of them are visual effects. We're going to show video one here. Uh, of course, this is the one, that the first ones that I saw. So we have this object here hovering over what is known as the Dome of the Rock. And here's a videographer shooting his friend who has a cell camera, who's holding the camera and, and filming also. So well, that is video two, and we'll show that after this. And we see movement down in here, the flickering of lights. Yep. So we know this is all real. Yep. It's not, it's not a photo, that's not, that part is in Photoshop. Yep. Now we're gonna see two flashes of light and the object's going to streak skyward. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> so uh, when I first saw this video, um, I was I was not skeptical about it initially, and it wasn't until the the object actually disappeared and right. did its stretch and disappeared that I noticed that it was wrong. The rest of the video is very jittery, which means it's not capturing at a, a normal frame rate. It's capturing uh -huh. at a slower frame rate. But when you stretch and disappear, that frame rate was perfect. The high, high frame rate of regular video editing systems. Correct. Okay, well, we're going to roll video two, Ro video two which yep. is from the videographer holding the cell phone. In front of it, yeah. Yeah, and now tell us what we're looking at here. I absolutely definitely think he's holding a camera. But um, I, if you really look at it carefully, you'll notice that that object, the camera's moving, and the object is actually moving at a different level than the actual camera's moving. So you think this was also done in post-production? I think that it was done in post-production. Now, well. is there a way to go back, let's say, to, to video one, where they show um, the, the man holding his cell phone, and is there a way to, to stop frame that, blow it up, and see if there's actually anything on it? No. Nope. Nothing at all? So we're not sure what we're looking at there either. Yeah. yeah. Now this is video four. I like this video a which, lot. Which came from, an, allegedly, from another videographer. Let's yep. look at that. Now, one of the things about this video that I want to point out is the fact that the, the aspect ratio is true high definition. What do you mean by that? 16 by 9. So I think that the I think the out of focusness of this shot is for sure deliberate because everything is in perfect out of focus except for our object. Right. This is 
lighting effects and a bunch of stuff. This is a lot of work to do this. This is this is not industrial light and magic special effects. This is still something you can do in your home computer, but it's still a lot of work. And so it's very clever. I mean, if it's a hoax, we got light here and we have shadow in the back. And when this thing leaves, immediately the dome goes into shadow. Your thoughts there, Tyler? The camera would overexpose or try to compensate for the exposure when the flash happened. So when the when the when the it, when it flashes, right. the camera would try to compensate. It wouldn't compensate quick enough. It just couldn't compensate quick enough. But it would try to compensate. So you would see the the image get darker, Yo! just just a a little bit. Now what what the would blur is really good. Everyone agrees pretty much across the board that, that video three is a hoax. Correct. And, and it's, it's very easy to see. Nothing moves. You know, yes. the little light comes down. The, 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 okay. And, do and there are no flashes. Yeah. Right. So video three is a hoax. But four, five, and six have differences than one and two. Explain that. They're, apparently they're shot in different locations, but there are artifacts or anomalies that we don't see in videos one and two. What are we looking at? Um, to me, the way I look at it is that if it was a real event, that's exactly the way it would be. My point is, if I had the original negative to something, right. then I would start believing it. But when, when it comes to how bored people are in today's world, <laughs> I think that it's very, very, very hard to believe things that are so... I'll give you an example of what I believe. I believe some of the Mexico stuff yeah, with, the little, with the little snail guys in the sky yeah, and all, the, all, of the, all, of the, all of the stuff uh, related to the infrared cameras where they shot a bunch yes. of red stuff. I agree. There is no absolute no doubt. Why? Because the guy took the original footage, he put it on YouTube, you can clearly see it's the right format, you can clearly see it's all kind of crisp and sharp, you can clearly see it's done with this handy cam, it's not shaky, all the objects in the sky look real, it all just fits. According to some recent studies, there are sightings of UFOs about every 10 minutes. Now I realize it, some of those things, many of them are hoaxes sure. or swamp gas or flocks of birds or Venus and all that. But let's just say some of them are real. It seems to be like the phenomena is burgeoning. Your thoughts? Well, I think that uh, the frequency is, high, is increasing. And as most people uh, uh, who studied this area realize, it's a difficult thing to study because of the f confusion, the noise, the hoaxes. And you've got to somehow slice through all of that. But even when you do, you discover there's a core group of things that are not only real, they're classified. Mm. Part of the other thing you run into is there's a sector of that that never sees the light of day because of security. And one of the things, because I came out of that world, I spent a good 30 years of my executive career as uh, in the classified community. And not only in the service, but in the intelligence community. And, then, and as a, a ch chief executive officer of four different publicly trained defense contractors. So I'm used to being in the deeply classified world for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point, for reasons I can't go into, but the thing that startled me to discover was that the UFO area enjoys a security classification that's higher than our most sensitive warheads, mm. the W88 warheads. And so that's, that's the mystery, is why are things like Roswell and other things like that, after over 60 years, still classified to this day mm. and and uh, you can't put you you can't pier two presidents of four congressmen tried to pierce that and couldn't the, the security that surrounds that area is astonishing why nobody knows because mm. it's classified mm -hmm. and so um, so that's why when you see these things uh, the, uh, the 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 famous V thing that went over Arizona back there and all that uh, there's there's it has earmarks of, of chicanery that involves the Department of Defense well, we're going to interview Marshall Masters and ask him a few questions about what we've been discussing in this film. Marshall used to be science producer at CNN and is now an expert on the Planet X phenomenon. With all the earthquakes, floods, fires, wars and rumors of wars and troublesome times, like the BP oil spill, is it business as usual or do you see it as something more? It's business as usual and then unusual business. Now, if you think back to Katrina 2005. We didn't have a problem with a shortage of oil that drove up food and gas prices. 
Rather, there was a shortage of oil infrastructure. So I want you to imagine, in my hand, I am holding a large semi-transparent balloon, and it's called the oil industry. Inside that balloon is a smaller balloon called agribusiness. Now, as man-made and natural disasters eat away at oil infrastructure, terminals, refineries, and so forth, it collapses in on agribusiness. Middle East unrest has pushed oil prices well above $100 a barrel, and that's translating into skyrocketing gas prices. Think of the last time you went to the store and you bought fruits from all over the world. It takes oil to move it there. And without the oil, it doesn't move. That is the problem. You see, as that big oil infrastructure bubble collapses, the problem is it will collapse in on agribusiness. Why are most people reticent to discuss current events? Reticence is primarily a programmed behavior. And it's easier for elites to do now because we live in a just-in-time economy. And so we expedite that reticence. But there are a growing number of us who are saying, mm -mm, no more programming for me. I'm going to march to the beat of a different drummer. And you know what, as a researcher, I think it's exciting because their numbers are exploding. Do you see us heading towards a tipping point, a point of no return? I see us approaching a storm of tipping points. And what bothers me is there are the ones we can see coming, but it's the ones we do not see coming. You know, think of Japan. General Electric goes out and builds the world's largest nuclear reactor power plant on a coastline facing a major fault system. And they're completely clueless as to how they got to where we are right now. Do ancient prophetic texts that you're familiar with discuss such a time as this? Well, um, as you had mentioned yourself, there are these scriptural passages that are, are, are leaning in that direction. But going through the interpretation of those passages, mm -hmm. it takes a little bit more discernment and, and uh, investigation. And among those who makes this investigation are the Talmudic sages. Then there is Rabbi Eliezer. He talked about 15 signs that you will know they were coming to the end of days, based on scriptural passages, but also his own prophetic insight. Mm -hmm. And he said, among them, the currency will be useless. Hmm. The pen will wither. Instead of, you know, fighting verbal wars, they will be picking up the sword again. The face of that generation will be like the face of a dog. What does that mean exactly? We go to hell. We need another one. Mubarak, destroy our country. Arrogance, and, and, and we call it Hebrew chutzpah. We don't want him. Listen to the people. We don't to want the him. Will, will be prevalent. The youth will no longer respect their elders, and even the leaders themselves, who normally should walk in front of their people, will walk behind them, similar to a, a, a human walking behind the dog that seems to be leading it, mm. leading the person. So there are a number of other predictions among them that the land will be measured with a cord, not a, a C C O R D, but with, with some kind of a, a stripe or some kind of a measuring stick. And if you notice, the land of Israel, it, 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 now there's a thing called this green line, which really doesn't exist in reality. It's something on a map, mm -hmm. uh, as if to say that the people who uh, are trying to move and be the movers and shakers are ready to determine how much of land Israel is going to be entitled to in the final you know, peace accord. Um, so all these ideas, the land being measured and uh, the, the economic markets you know, going haywire, uh, the fact that people, instead of settling their differences verbally, will start, try to do this when, in, with missiles are all alluded to in this, these chapters that Rebbe, the sage Rebbe Yezer had written 1800 years ago. When Jesus in Luke 21 says that this generation shall not pass away at all, he's talking about them. Because it was 38 years uh, from the time he said that uh, until the fall of Jerusalem. That's the same, a generation. Wow. The same generation, uh, 38 years in Deuteronomy 2 verse 14 where the, uh, uh, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, mm -hmm. let's round it off. Mm -hmm. Actually, precisely, it's 38 from Deuteronomy and so forth. In Matthew 24, when he uses that expression, different context, he uses the same, this generation shall not pass. In Matthew 24, I believe he's talking about this generation we're in. 
What he means is that last year, that's all, that this generation will all happen within one window. Now the trick is what what triggers that. A lot of people thought it was the 48, 48, that, that's 65. There's, there's no basis for any of that. Right. Okay, but I think see, I I, I think that uh, from the hypothesis har from the rapture on, it's going to all be within a, a single generation. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in that general, moving into that generation. Mm -hmm. What I find amazing as a researcher is a vast majority of Americans, more than a supermajority in fact, believe that UFOs are real. And yet, they continue to be silenced and intimidated by a small minority of very vocal, mean-spirited people who refuse to look at the obvious. Why is it they don't want to look? Because perhaps they don't want the rest of us to notice what's really going on. Our house is on fire, and that's why all the neighbors are coming. I think when we put all these things together, we're looking at something, and what we're looking at is what I believe the fulfillment of ancient prophetic texts that were written thousands of years ago and yet in these what I would consider last days we're starting to see the fulfillment of those ancient prophecies. We are definitely finding evidence that Elenin is affecting the Earth in terms of the celestial alignments that are triggering recent seismicity. Check out these aerial pictures. These are entire towns that are now essentially wiped off the map. Nothing is left. The word spread from person to person. They got bin Laden. Go four days before Osama bin Laden was ostensibly killed. What was the big news? Ben Bernanke. And what did he do? He had a public press conference, first time in the history of the Federal Reserve. As Bernanke was speaking, the dollar was crashing. It's not true. Life is great. The planet's fine. And you'll be fine. Hello. 